All aboard for the transcribed premiere production, The Cruise of the Paul Parrot. This exciting, thrilling story of the sea and the adventurous days of whaling. Well, Johnny Robbins and Sue Grange are now definitely going to sail on this whaling cruise. But there is still plenty of mystery surrounding it. Sue's brother Ezra, the owner of the ship, changed his mind about letting Johnny come along after he looked at a map with Johnny's father's signature on it. Then, too, there's a peculiar chopping sound down in the hold. And I'll test him, may still be hiding aboard. In our last adventure, Captain Dalton and his mate, George Wainwright, went down in the hole to find where the chopping sound came from. And today, we'll hear what they discovered. It is now the next morning. The captain is talking to his crew. Most of you have shipped on whalers before. And those who haven't are wise enough and brave enough to learn the ropes after a few days' run. From now on, we set our course direct for the whaling grounds off South America. We should raise our first whale in about a month. In that time, we'll have daily drills in manning the whale boats and practice with the irons and lance to make you good whalemen all. But this I want you to understand, men. Aboard the Pile Parrot, you'll be treated as you would aboard a merchantman. There'll be no slave driving by me or my officers, and each one of you will be expected to work his hardest. You're all set on your honor and your reputation as first-class seamen, and we know you'll work with us accordingly. This is to be a fairly short cruise, not lasting over a year and a half. And if we work as well together as we can, we'll cut in so many whales and stow so many casks of oil below that we can laugh at all the old whalers who think that whalemen have to be driven with a belay and pin and a rope's end. Well said, Roy. They're with you to a man after that bit of wind. Gee, Captain, that was wonderful. Your men couldn't help liking you now. Oh, vast, Johnny, let's hope so. With the strange things going on aboard this bark, I'll need the men with me every knot of the way. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Mr. Wainwright. Hello, Johnny. Good morning, Miss Sue. Oi, our charming little passengers on deck. And looking prettier than a spring morning in the South Sea. Hello, Sue. Gee, you should have just heard the fine speech Captain Dalton gave his men. Tell me, Captain. I never did find out if you discovered anything in the hold yesterday. You blow me down. There was nary a trace of a stowaway. We searched every square inch of the hold, and there wasn't so much as a shipworm in the hull. Hmm. Did you hear the chopping sound, Captain? I heard it when I was Mr. Granger's cabin. But the moment we went below, there wasn't a sound. It looks funny to me, Captain. It looks funny to all of us. But what are we to do about it? That's the question. Well, Johnny lad, you're now our cabin boy, remember? Dickens not on duty now. He's off watch. Search him out and have him tell you whatever you want to know about anything aboard the Paul Parrot. Mr. Wainwright and I'll be getting uh, busy with the men in trying to handle the whale boats. Aye, aye, Captain. I'll find Dickens right away. I'll come along, too, if you don't mind, Johnny. Of course. I want you to, Sue. Let's look near the bows. We should find them near the forecastle. Johnny, what do you think of that map my brother Ezra has with your father's name on it? Well, I don't know what to think, Sue. You see, my father was a seaman for many years. He used to tell me all kinds of wonderful yarns. But something happened to him once. I don't know just what it was that he said made him lose all faith in the life of a seaman, and he left the sea forever. That's why he settled on a farm inland from New Bedford. And that's why he never would let me go to sea. He said he didn't want me to suffer the same kind of disappointment he did. You know, I had to run away from home to go to sea because Father wouldn't let me go willingly. I could ask Brother Ezra about the name on that map, but you see, he doesn't know I saw it. Oh, no, Sue. Better not say anything about it to him. Captain Dalton thinks there's a great deal of mystery about this cruise, doesn't he? Do you blame him? Well, first, there was this man Altesti doing all those strange things before we sailed. And then Mr. Grange acting so queerly about my name. And then that chopping in the hold. Oh, there's been lots of other things, too. Johnny, let you and me be partners. Well, sure, Sue, but what do you mean? Well, I like Captain Dalton. Let's try to find out what all this mystery's about. You bet. All right, Sue, we'll try to find what lays behind it all. Fine. Oh, look, Johnny, there's old Dickon sitting on the foreheads with his parent. Sure enough. Oh, Dickon! Strike my jibs, it's the young'uns. Ahoy there! Come over and join an old seaman who's had nothing to do but listen to an empty-headed parrot speaking. Wrong! Speak for yourself, matey! Speak for yourself! <laughs> <laughs> I like Paul Parrot. He sure can say a lot of words. <laughs> Aye, he's a clever bird, and you can lay to that. He's seen more of whaling in storms of sea than many a hand aboard this bark has. We wanted to ask you something about whaling, Dickon. And then I wanted you to tell me what I'm supposed to do as cabin boy. Well, lad, there's little you have to worry about but obeying orders. Take your orders from Captain Dalton and Mr. Wainwright and the other officers. And don't worry about the men. You're lucky in having the captain as your friend. Abide to what he says and you'll not go wrong. He's a fine man. I think so too, Dickon. Ah, he's hale and hearty and a seaman born and the wind never blew what could blow the man down. Ah, Stow the ah, gaff, you lover. Stow it. <laughs> Johnny, lad, 
Do you know the parts of the ship? Ooh, the names of the sails and the ropes and the decks and the beams of the old. My father taught me most of that, Dickon. Of course, I don't know so much about a whaler. My father always shipped on a merchantman. Ooh, that's good, matey. Then there's much you've already learned. Now about whalers. How many men are on a whaler, Dickon? Well, the Paul Parrot's a good example of a first-class whaler as any. So just cast a look at her. There's the captain and four mates, each one of them in charge of a whaleboat. As you know, this ship carries four whaleboats. Mm -hmm. Our four mates, which are the only men on board to give you orders, are Mr. Wainwright first, Mr. Jowett second, Mr. Boscara third, and Mr. Nicholson fourth. And Mr. Nicholson is usually the helmsman, too. Then there are four boat steerers, too, one to each whaleboat. The boat steerers are the men who throw the harpoons. Whoa. How can they steer the boats and throw the harpoons at the same time? A bass said I'll come to that later. Then there's 16 hands, four for each belt, ordinary seamen, and four extra men who stay on the ship and all the rest of the crew is out chasing whales. Besides these, there's the cooper, who takes care of the casks we fill with oil, and also acts as the carpenter for the ship. Then there's the cook and the steward, his helper, who also acts as the ship's doctor. And then you as the cabin boy and... and me. Ah, oh, give me a lay to that, me hearties! <laughs> Shiver me timbers, I almost forgot our mascot here, Paul Barrett himself. Tell us, Dickon, how do you catch a whale? Well, Miss Sue, they keep a mate and a boat steerer at the foremast head at all times, and two seamen at the mainmast head to keep a lookout. When the whales are running close, they even kept up at night. Then when a whale is sighted, the lookout calls oh, out... There she blows, four points off the starboard bow, there she blows. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just what they calls out. This swab took the very words right out of me mouth. And then do they lower the boats? That's right, lad. They lower away it is. They lower one boat for each whale, and as he's a big one, then they lower two. The crew of four rows it with the mate in the stern with the steering oar. And the boat steer up in the bow holding the iron. That's what we call the harpoons, irons. Well, why do they call the harpooner the boat steer if the mate steers? Lay by a bit, Miss Sue. I'm coming to that. When they reach the whale, creeping up on him soft-like, so he don't notice... The boat steerer strikes him with the iron, and then the fun begins. Gee, doesn't the whale try to get away? That's just it, lad. The whale either sounds and he dives under, or strikes out straight away, or mills. That means goes around in circles. But no matter what he does, the whale boat's got to hang on. When the strike is made, the mate and the boat steerer jump to change places. Then the boat steerer really steers, and he has a worrisome trick to keep the little craft on an even keel while the mate stands on the bow with the lance and plays in the rope that's attached to the iron stuck into the whale. Oh, my, that sounds exciting. And finally, the bloomin' whale's yes. bound to tire out. Sometimes he's towed the whale boat miles and miles from the ship, and there's always the chance that he might turn on the boat and smash it to splinters with his big flukes. Oh. I've heard that whales sometimes get as big as 50 feet or so. Lad, I've seen him over a hundred. That's a lot of animal to get angry at you. Gee, I should think so. Well, mates, finally the whale tires out, barring no mishap, and comes to rest. Then the boat sneaks up on him again, and the mate shoves the lance in him and kills him. Oh, my. Oh, that all sounds terribly dangerous. Aye, aye, it is that. Now do you see what you let yourselves in for, mates? Johnny, promise me you won't try to go out and help them catch a whale. Oh, I'm not afraid to. Oh. But I don't suppose I'll have to, unless they ask me. I'd like to learn. <laughs> well, lad, it'll be some time before they trouble you with chasing whales, is my guess. But when you'll have to work is after the whale boat tows the whale right up to the ship. Then they starts the cutting in. The blubber is boiled till all the oil's out of it and put in the casks and sealed and cooled and then sent below and stalled in the hole. In a few words, lad, that's whaling. But if it took a fleet of books, I couldn't begin to tell well, you... Well, batten down my hat. Here's old Dickens. Free and nurse me to a couple of blooming pots. <gasps> Who's that? Blow me down. <laughs> That's one hand on the screws that'll cause trouble. Red Mulhooly. And he's a mean, sneaking junk of bill scum, if I've ever seen one. I've asked, he's coming this way. Well, so here's the bloody kids this whaler's got to ship, huh? A pretty thing whaling's coming to when we've got to have a nursery aboard. And a pretty landlubber that sets in his cabin downstairs and calls himself an owner. What's he doing aboard, the blooming shark? You can't talk that way about my brother. Well, the little brig's carrying guns, what? eh? What do you mean, you little spitfire? Oh. I'll say what I want, and you'd better not be the one to try and stop me, or I'll... Wait spit... a minute. Don't talk to her like that. What are you going to do about it, you little porpoise? You blooming swab, why don't you lay off the young'uns? Will he summon your size? Go on. your top, you can. I'll bound a balloon pin off your tarp rail. And you, you're the captain's pet, eh? But you can't talk back to me. I'm not the captain's pet. I'll show you. Oh, kick me in the shins, will you? I'll teach you a lesson you'll never forget, you little imp. 
I'll take this rope. Watch out, Johnny. Oh, Captain, don't. Hell, bully the young ones, will you? Take that. Oh. Mm. Good. You were just in time, Captain. And there's more in it for you if you try that again, you war frat. Come along, Nate. He'll not bother you again. You'll pay for that, you yellow bat schwab. They'll be looking for a new captain before the end of a fortnight. You can lay to that. Here's more trouble ahead. Captain Dalton has made a dangerous enemy by striking Red. Will this seaman carry out his threat to have revenge on the captain? And we still haven't solved the riddle of the map with Johnny's father's signature on it or the noise in the hold. We'll find out more about these things as we follow the adventures of Johnny and Sue with Captain Dalton and Dickon and all the rest of the crew on the cruise of the Paul Parrot. Your Paul Parrot announcer is Dave Ward. <laughs> 